welcome Vista Church. Thank you for watching. Make sure to share, start a watch party, um, get people watching. We'd love to have them join this awesome church family. Um, thank you for worshiping with us. I hope you had an awesome Mother's Day. Um, we're excited to be with you in spirit. And hopefully we can see each other in person soon. Let's get started. Out of the shadows, bound for the gallows, a dead man walking to love came calling. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Six feet under. This, uh, we're going to sing this next song, Stand in Your Love. And, you know, right now, there's such a feeling of wonder. What's going to happen? But we know that our lives and our future are in the Lord's hands. We have no fear. His perfect love cast out fear. Ready, guys?
place will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Oh, we are praise. Oh, we love you, Jesus. So good, Jesus. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night as you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen, oh, I've seen many searching for rest.
so good. Lord, thank you that all your plans for us are for good and for a hope and for a future and not for harm. And Lord, we just thank you. We trust you, God. Lord, we open up our hearts to your word today that you would speak to us, God. Lord, that we would be changed because we heard your word and we abided in your word this morning. In Jesus' name. You know, there are some times when I get a chance to preach a section of Scripture that as I'm going through it, the Lord is just opening my eyes to how perfect it fits for what it is that maybe I'm going through or maybe something I know that someone else is going through. And in this case, today, I'm really stoked because what we're going to be looking at applies to what we're all going through. And so we're going to turn and we're going to look at the Church of Smyrna, Revelation chapter 2. If you've got Bibles, I want to invite you to turn there. This is the next church that we're looking at. Last week was the Church of Ephesus. Today is the Church of Smyrna. Let's read it together, chapter 2, starting in verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and he who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Jesus, we pray that as we look at your word this morning, you would give us ears to hear. And not only that, but eyes to see. Help us to be able to know how this applies to our lives. And I pray that your word would minister the peace and the hope and the truth that only it can bring and only it can do in our lives. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus, in your precious and holy name. Amen. You know, one of the the coolest things when we get a chance to go to Israel, and I took a, a group from Vista in 2017, been a couple other times besides that, and one of the coolest things that we do on one of those days when we're in Israel is we go to the Yad Vashem, the, uh, the museum, the Holocaust museum. And it's, it's something that we allot about three or four hours for because it's something that you walk through at your own pace. And there are so many different things that you are able to see about that most tragic time in the history of this world. We see how it was that millions of Jews were persecuted at the hands of an absolute madman. Now, it's not the first time a group of people have been persecuted for the beliefs and their way of life. In fact, listen to a short bio of this madman. He was just three years old when his father died. It was little loss to the boy because his father had been a killer, a bully, and a cheat. 
His mother assumed the teaching role for the boy, and she continued his education. She murdered his stepfather with a dish of poisonous mushrooms. He was raised by reprobates, and he proved the old phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. While still young, he committed his first murder, killing a teenage boy who stood in his way, and he watched him die with a cold, calloused indifference. He married at 15, but soon had his wife killed. He married again and slew his second wife as well. In order to marry a third time, he murdered the husband of the woman he wanted to marry. He was a very resourceful man. His mother grew to annoy him, and so he arranged her murder. He was an ugly man with a bull neck, beetle brows, a flat nose, and a tough mouth. He had a pot belly, spindly legs, bad skin, and offensive odor. At the age of 31, he was sentenced to death by flogging. But instead of facing his crimes with any amount of dignity, he fled to a dingy basement in the house of a slave, and he cut his own throat. This man, as much as any other, gave the infant church its first taste of things to come. His name was Nero, and he was the first of the Caesars to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. Now, the truth was the suffering of those who claimed the name of Jesus, it didn't stop with this man, and it didn't start with him either. In fact, you've got to realize that Jesus himself said, for those of us that would follow him, we would face suffering, right? In fact, in Matthew 5, verse 10, it says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. These are Jesus' words. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, he says, when people insult you, when they persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, he says, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then in that same chapter, Jesus said these words in verse 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rains rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And right after that, we know Jesus went into the parable of the wise and the foolish builder about those who built their house on the rock and those who built their house on the sand, and that rain would come and it would do its work in each of those people's lives, the righteous and the unrighteous. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, listen, I, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And then he says in Philippians 1, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Now, I don't know about you, but I would say that's a list of verses that would be optional if I had a choice, right? And those aren't things that I get excited about. Oh boy, as Christians, we're going to face persecution, Jesus says, Count it all joy. I mean, those are things that are challenging to hear. But you know, as you survey Scripture, as you look at all the different people that Scripture paints a picture of and how they lived their lives, um, there were individuals and stories that God included in His Word. There's always been a season of suffering for God's people, right? You look at Abraham and how it was that Abraham had his season of difficulty with Hagar and Ishmael. You look at Job. Boy, there's the poster child for suffering, right? There's the poster child for how it is that this life can be difficult. You look at David and his son Absalom and how it was that he absolutely made his life difficult and painful. You look at Peter and the suffering that Peter went through for his faith. Paul the same. And even as we look today at the Apostle John, remember, John was on this island of Patmos writing this letter simply because he was preaching the word of God. He was sharing about the gospel of Jesus Christ and he was arrested and he was isolated to this island. And so the Lord has John, a suffering servant, write to a church that was going through some of the worst suffering that the believers of Jesus Christ have ever gone through. And so he starts there in verse eight, looking at this place called Smyrna, the city of Smyrna. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. Now realize this is the modern day city of Izmir in western Turkey. 
This city has continued on. You could go there today and walk the streets. In that day, it was one of the greatest cities in the region. It was destroyed in 580 BC and then rebuilt in 290 BC. In fact, it was one of the most beautiful cities in all of that time. Its beauty was renowned. And the population of Smyrna in New Testament times was about 200,000 people. So we're talking a very large and sizable city. On its coins, it read Smyrna, first in Asia in beauty and size. The first temple to the goddess Roma was built here in 195 BC. And listen, in AD 26, because of its long loyalty to Rome and the emperor, Smyrna beat out 10 other cities for the privilege of building a temple to honor the great Roman emperor Tiberius. That's what it is that John was writing to, this place and the Christians living in that city. And hold on, because this was a city given over to Rome and the worship of Rome. More about that in a minute. But let's look at the comfort that Jesus wants to bring these believers. He says in the rest of verse 8, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Now, it's really easy to read that fast and read over it and not even think about what it says. But you know, here are this. I find it terribly important that the first thing Jesus does as he's writing to all of these churches, no matter which one it is, is he wants them to know who he is. He reminds them of his character. He reminds them of what it is that he is going to do for them. You know, if you were going through a difficult time, and uh, maybe you were facing some persecution, some difficulty. Um, Maybe you have a job in a company, a sizable company. And in that job, you're, you're going through it, your coworkers, your boss. How would you feel if the CEO of that company was made aware of what you're going through, and then that person himself writes a letter to you? And he wants you to know, hey, this is the CEO. I know what you're going through, right? And in a very real way, that kind of, wow, that now I've got someone's attention, that very thing is what Smyrna could describe this or give attribute to what Jesus wanted to say to these people. Wow, Jesus, the first and the last, right? The one who died and is alive again. Jesus speaks, and he wants this church to hear from them. And what he wants to do is remind them of who it is that was writing his character, and his identity. And that's why he says the first and the last, the protos and the eschatos. That's what it means. Um, This is his divinity. This is his deity. I've been around from the beginning and to the end. I've always been here. His eternality. He's saying this is God speaking to you. A CEO would be cool, but the God of all the universe, aware and speaking, that's what we want, amen? And then he says, who was dead and came to life. You see, Jesus wants these folks to know that he was victorious over death. And Smyrna may be able to take away the city of Smyrna, the people of Smyrna, as we're going to see the suffering they were going through. They may be able to take away your present life, but Jesus is saying he is the one who guarantees their future life. Just as he was dead and rose again, those of us who put our faith in Jesus we will do the same. And so he reminds them of who it is. Remember who I am. And you know what? Sometimes the most important thing that we can do when we're going through difficulties, when we're facing trials and tribulations in this life, one of the most important things we can do is to remember who Jesus is. You might be going through a difficulty in your marriage today struggling with your husband or your wife, and you're having questions, and it doesn't seem like, seem like things are getting any better, you need to remember that Jesus is the God of reconciliation. Amen? Jesus can bring two people separated. He can bring them together. He can do miracles in your marriage. You need to remember that. You might be facing sickness and disease We need to remember that he is the God of healing. Whether or not it's in this life or the next, he is able to be there for us. 
We need to remember if you're beginning to despair about the future, your future, our future, the country's future, the world's future, we need to remember He is the God of hope. Amen? Our hope is not in our politicians, our government. Our hope is not that everything gets back to normal, though that's human nature. But our hope is in Jesus Christ. Are you with me this morning? It's in Him and His goodness. You need to remember if you feel alone and isolated and forgotten by everyone else, that he is the God of love and he loves you and he has not forsaken you, forgotten about you. He is with you. You need to remember if you've come to a place, hear this, where your decisions have messed up your life, you need to remember that he is the God of forgiveness and he is the God of grace and he gives second and third and fourth chances. Folks, one of the most important things we can do in all of these life circumstances, one of the most important things is to remember who it is that we love and worship. That's why he starts by saying, here's who it is that's writing to you. And then he turns and he says, here's what I know. God knows. And John is writing and letting these Christians in the church of Smyrna know something about what God knows. In verse 9, he says this, Jesus does to this church, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. And so stop and look at what God knows, what Jesus knows about this church. He knows three things. He says he knows their affliction, he knows their poverty, and he knows their persecution. So when it comes to these things, first of all, affliction or, or this persecution, um, you need to know that the word affliction literally means pressure. And this isn't just a light pressure. This is a pressure that's so heavy and so strong, it's a crushing pressure. And these Christians, they were not facing a light or a simple thing. They were going through something that was literally crushing them in their faith. In fact, they were living under the type of pressure and tribulation that was literally destroying them. And that's why these words had to come in at just the right time to bring what only Jesus can bring. So what was this pressure coming from? Well, realize, first of all, they had Roman pressure that they were dealing with. You see, Smyrna, as I said earlier, was one of the biggest cities given over to the Roman way of life and worshiping the Roman emperors, the cult that they did when they declared Caesar as Lord. And you know that they had these, these uh, places where it was that Tiberius, the, the Roman emperor, this shrine given over to him. And they would take a pinch of incense and they would go as part of their sacrifice in this Roman cult worship is they would take that pinch of incense and offer it on to the altar and they would say, Caesar is Lord. And at this time, that Caesar was Domitian. And Domitian was declaring that everybody had to worship him. It was the first time. I mean, they would say that the, the, the Caesars were, you know, like God, but Domitian was actually saying he was God. I mean, this guy was nuts. He was crazy. And so you better believe the Christians, though they obeyed the civil laws that were in existence for Rome, they, they weren't obeying this law, this spiritual law, to say Caesar is Lord because they believed in one Jesus, one Lord, and that's who they worshiped. Amen? I believe there's even something there for us. Because, you know, I want to follow the laws of the land, but when it comes to a place, and I don't know if it's far off or not, where we're going to be forced to do certain things against our faith. My encouragement, even if it goes against the laws of the land, my encouragement is that we would worship Jesus Christ. Are you with me? And I know Romans 13 says obey the laws of the land, but that's when the government is doing what's in the best interest of the people. But when that government starts to steer us away from Jesus, and folks, the book of Revelation is full of this. The book of Revelation is talking about the Antichrist that's going to come up out of the sea. And then the little man that comes up behind him, right? The little Antichrist, the small one. And these two are going to demand to be worshipped just like the Caesar Domitian was demanding to be worshipped then. I don't know if it's going to happen in our lifetime or if it's going to happen in the next. We don't know. But if and when that time were to come, 
My challenge is that we choose to worship Jesus Christ, amen? That we don't go anywhere else and that we don't, well, we've got to do this or else we can't buy or sell, we can't travel, we can't eat, we can't, you know what, if that be the case, let this church minister. These people, they dealt with this Roman pressure to worship Caesar and they said, no way, and Rome hated them for it. And it was actually capital punishment if you didn't do this. Not only that, folks, we also know they faced abject poverty. Abject poverty. Because when they wouldn't participate in the Roman imperial cult, they were excluded from the workers' guilds. Unemployment and poverty were theirs. In fact, this word for poverty is the kind that means abject poverty, possessing nothing. This isn't just like, well, we can't go out to eat. This is we don't have anything to eat, and we have no money to buy anything. They couldn't get a job to save their lives, and they had no means to take care of their families. And Jesus says, I know of your poverty. And lastly, he says, I know of your persecution. In this case, it was persecution from the Jews in that city. You know, it had a large Jewish population, Smyrna did. And that population, they strongly opposed Christianity. In fact, in the 80s, leading up to this, Judaism, they had excommunicated the Christian heretics from the synagogues, and they wanted nothing to do with these Christians. And so they had opposition from the Roman Empire, opposition from the Jews in the city, and it posed a double threat, throw in the poverty. I mean, this is a tough place to be. And if ever there was a person that could say, I know your tribulation I know what you're going through. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? He was aware of it. To be sure, pain and suffering. We know we're a part of life. Jesus said as much. But you know what? I'll be honest with you. The first thing I would have asked, hey, Jesus, I'm glad you know about this. Is there any way you could do something about this? I mean, that, that's my human nature, Oh, we're glad that you know about our, our afflictions. We know, you know about our poverty. You know about our persecution. But I sure would like it if you could stop it, right? I sure would like it if you could take care of it. Now, have you ever asked or heard the question asked, why do bad things happen to good people? I don't even think it's really the right way to ask the question, why we, is, why we have so much confusion about it. The truth is, bad things happen to all people. Good or bad, right? Bad things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to good people. I think the real question behind that is, why does a good God allow bad things to happen to good people? And, you know, there are no good people according to the Bible. We're all sinful. All of us deserve death. But I, I think it's dialing up something for those of us that know Jesus Christ. We, we would love it if Jesus would keep us from and protect us from these kind of things, we would love it if he would make sure that we didn't face difficulties in this life, trials and tribulations. But the thing that we come to understand about them, that maybe the more that we walk with the Lord, is how God uses them. How God is able to take those trials, those tribulations, those things that we don't have answers for. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of things in my life that I don't have answers for. There's a lot of things even right now that I wish I had answers for, but I don't. And you know what? The thing that we know and can come to learn, just like a parent, how many of you sometimes you see your kids, maybe as they grow older or even younger, and, and you know that they're, they're headed for something bad and you want to help them, but is there ever a time when, you know what, they made their bed, they need to lie in it so they might learn from it? You better believe. Like, let's take, for example, if your kids were to go in debt. Make a whole lot of bad decisions financially. Rack up credit cards. You know, when you go to college, the first thing you do on, on that opening day is there's all over, there's all these credit card offers. And maybe your kids were to get a bunch of credit cards racked up, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And you know, they, they come to that place where they realize, I, I can't pay this. Mom and dad, we know you have some money. Can you pay this for me? Thank you. You know, it would be really kind of unwise. Instead, you know, hey, there's something you need to learn from this. I want to help you, but I don't think that helping you that way is really going to help you. I think you need to learn from this circumstance or from your mistakes. 
I've learned so much from my mistakes, and there's so many times that I'm glad that my parents... In fact, there's so many times that I'm glad that God didn't step in and change because I needed to learn through something. I needed to grow from my mistakes. It's not whether or not you make mistakes. I say this to my kids all the time. It's how you respond to your mistakes that makes all the difference in the world. Amen? And so we look at this and we look at the suffering, the trials and the difficulties. Paul knew about suffering, right? He went through it. He endured it. He came to understand that for the Christian, pain and suffering were a prize and a privilege. In fact, we just studied this not too long ago, James chapter 1. Remember when we were looking through the book of James and taught through this? James chapter 1 verse 2 says this about trials and tribulations. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because, he says, you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And he goes on to say person, perseverance must finish its work so that, and here's the growth, so that you and me may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How, according to James, and for that matter, Jesus and the rest of the word, do we grow in our faith? We grow through trials. We grow through difficulties. I would love it if Jesus would stop all bad things from happening to all people, but that's not reality, and none of us would grow. If I were to stop every bad thing from ever happening to my children, would they ever cry out and seek help from something that's bigger than them? Bigger than them? No. And that's one of the biggest things I've realized. When I face something that I can't handle, and when I face something that I wish wasn't happening, but yet it is... It's one of those times when I realize I cry out to God like never before. I seek God because I say to myself, I can't deal with what it is that I'm going through. Where's my help come from? My help comes from, and I seek him. And he knows that. He knows when we face those things that are bigger than us, that our desire should be and hopefully will be to seek him in a way that when things aren't bad, maybe we don't. And so all of this works together. We learn in these trials and these difficulties so much about our need for our God and his strength and his peace. Amen? Let me say that one more time. When we go through it in this life, like they were, affliction, poverty, persecution, when we go through it in those ways and many others, we have that opportunity to seek God like no other and to seek his peace, and to seek his strength. And I want to encourage you even now. We're going through it in some ways. Not like they were. Not not in the same ways that they were. I know some of us have lost our jobs. I know some people have lost family and friends. Um, It's it's tragic. It's a part of this life, yes. Um, And so we're suffering in some ways as well. But, you know, for a lot of us so far, the suffering that we've gone through um, hasn't been this severe, severe. It hasn't been this difficult. But yet, no matter what it is, we need to be people that seek Jesus during these times. Amen? To find our answers in Him. To find our hope in Him. I sometimes lay in my bed before I get up and I grab my phone and I start reading all the different news sources. MSNBC, that's a mistake. CNN, that's a bigger mistake. Fox News, a little better, but still a mistake. Drudge Report used to be good, now it's heinous. And I still go through the motions because I want to educate myself about what's going on. And you know what? After about half an hour of it, I just stop and I say to myself, why didn't I start with the word? Why didn't I start by seeking Jesus instead of reading all of this junk, all of the contradictions? It's such a good lesson. In fact, today I did that very thing. I I spent time before my wife got up and, and I read. And then when she got up, I said, sweetheart, let's grab the word. Let's pray together this morning and let's read the word together this morning. And when we sought the Lord, guess what? All of that junk that I just read, all the contradictions that I just read, it all went out the wayside, and I was able to have God's peace and God's hope and God's strength. Amen. We need to seek the Lord right now like no other, because He knows what we're going through, and He cares about what we're going through. Look at what we look at next. Verse 10, God cares. 
Jesus says to these people, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I wouldn't like that. Whoa, hold on, wait a minute. But he says, do not be afraid about uh, what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution, he says, for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He starts by saying, do not be afraid. It's one of the most prolific commands in all of the Bible. Do not be afraid. He says, you will suffer. You, some of you will be put in prison by Satan. Some of you will be tested. Some of you will be persecuted for 10 days. Some people are saying that's literal 10 days, or 10 days just can mean in the Bible a brief amount of time. Either way, you're going to be persecuted, he says. And ultimately, some of you will be put to death. And he says, in spite of all of that, do not be afraid. You know, I did a study on the word fear and researched the antonyms, the opposites for this word afraid or fear. And I came up with assurance. I came up with poise. I came up with composure. But you know what I didn't see when I did a study of the antonyms for fear? I, I didn't see strength. I didn't see peace. And you see, what the Lord was saying to this little church was Christians living in Smyrna, here's who I am. And here's what you're going to go through in this city. If you haven't already faced these things, you will. And when you do, don't forget where your strength and don't forget where your peace comes from. It comes from Jesus. Are you with me? It comes from the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords. It comes from knowing him. It comes from trusting him. And it comes from having our hope in him. And then he ends with these amazing words in verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Four verses. Realize in this, there's absolutely no there's no thing that Jesus is pointing out that this church is doing wrong, like the church of Ephesus and like the church of Laodicea. Of these seven churches, only two have nothing that they were doing wrong. It doesn't mean that they weren't doing anything wrong. It just means that Jesus was coming only to encourage them. He had only good words to say to them. And folks, never forget, we overcome the struggles of this world the difficulties of this world, the cares of this world by staying close to Jesus Christ. That's what we just talked about in Wednesday nights, right? Abiding in him, John 15. Not losing your first love like the church of Ephesus, not drifting away. And the way that you're gonna do that is by remaining in Jesus Christ. Remaining and abiding close to him. And we're promised when we do that we will overcome this world. Why? Because Jesus overcame this world, didn't he? John 16, he said in verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, he says, I have overcome this world. Folks, Jesus makes it clear that our ultimate peace is not found in this world. Our ultimate peace is not found in things getting back to normal because even if and when they get back to normal, it's still a sin-filled and sin-stained world, isn't it? We're still going to face trials and difficulties in our marriages, in our finances, in our families, with our careers. This world is full of trouble, the Bible says. Jesus declared it. And that's why it is that no matter what we go through, if we cling to and hold on to Jesus right now and next year and five years from now and 10 years from now, no matter what it is, folks, we're going to have his peace and we're going to have his strength. Amen? I, I start to get excited and it's an empty room. I can't wait for you folks to be back here because this is good stuff. The word of God is what we need to hold on to in Jesus Christ, which it points us to. In fact, it's been said, listen to this, trials 
and tribulations strengthen and refine genuine saving faith. Some of the most deep and mature Christians are the ones who have so many battle scars, right? You know, they, they've, they've wrestled with the Lord. They've wrestled with difficulty. Trials and tribulations strengthen and refine genuine saving faith. But likewise, it says, these trials and tribulations, they uncover and destroy false faith. Hypocrites and people who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when tough times come, they get going. They walk away. Well, I thought Jesus would take care of everything. I thought Jesus would protect us from everything. He never promised to do that, but he promised to get us through everything. Amen. He promised to always be there, to never leave us, never forsake us, to be our strength, to be our hope, to be our peace, no matter what we go through. That's the good news. And folks, this church, the church of Smyrna, these four short verses, they show us how to properly respond when we face trials and tribulations. Don't live in fear. Do not be afraid. Instead, cling to Jesus and him alone. Because Jesus conquered Satan, he conquered sin, and he conquered death, right? And in Jesus, we will do the same as well. Our home is in heaven, and Jesus is coming back to take us to be with him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this morning, we're so thankful for this example of this church who was up against it in some of the most severe ways, in ways that some of us can relate to and ways that others of us can't. We, we haven't in America faced persecution for our faith like this. It's happened in history. Martyrs have happened for sure. People who lost their lives for their faith, it's happened. We know it's happened in other parts of the world, communist countries, places where you can't worship Jesus, places where you can't have church openly. But here in America, we've not faced this kind of persecution. We've faced trials and difficulties. But Lord Jesus, I'm thankful that no matter where we are, no matter what we go through, our need and desire is to cry out to you, to find our hope and our peace and our strength in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we pray that you would get us through these times. We pray that you would bring us through these times with a deeper faith, a grown faith, a strengthened faith, that we might be able to weather the next storms, the next difficulties, the next challenges of life, and continue to stay close in our walks with you. We love you this morning, Jesus. We praise you. And we're so thankful that when we cry out and recognize our need for you, your promise is to always be there for us. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so, Jesus, we recognize we need you like no other time. Right now, we need you. And it's in your name that we pray these things. And the whole church said, amen. Let's sing that song. Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My
my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay awesome thing to be able to say because when we say that the promise is you'll always be there for us come to me all you who are heavy and weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest what a thing for us to recognize today Jesus thank you for loving us thank you for being with each one of us and thank you that you love us and you have our lives in your hands and you said no one will snatch them out of my hand and so we know we're safe with you we know we're secure with you. And Lord, we know our future with you. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Hey, thanks again for joining us today. Have an awesome Sunday in the Lord. And may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Have an awesome week in the Lord. God bless.